Welcome everyone to the LCP Foundation's next installment of our Scholar Spotlight series. I am thrilled and honored to introduce to you all James Murray of the University of Kentucky. He'll be presenting Ethnicity Over Race, an Ethical Argument for Increasing the Presence of American Descendants of Slavery, ADOS, and universities through disaggregating black racial data and categorization. James Murray, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. All right, uh, thank you for having me. Um, can you all hear me well? Okay. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I am a, a second year PhD student at the University of Kentucky. Um, I uh, am pursuing a PhD in education uh, sciences with an emphasis on uh, philosophical and cultural inquiry. Um, right now, um, I am getting ready to take my uh, candidacy exams in a few weeks and uh, wrap up those papers. So uh, uh, this is a this is a, a actually a, a project I plan on uh, doing for my dissertation. So this is um, something I'm really passionate about and excited to talk about. Um, so, um, if you guys recall the title, um, uh, I named it Ethnicity Over Race, and, um, I'm specifically focusing on, um, for non-HBCU, uh, uni universities and colleges. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, how to put an emphasis on disaggregating black racial data, um, uh, into more specific uh, ethnic data. And the reason for that is that because the quality of life differences among, um, uh, among uh, blacks in the United States are very different depending on um, ethnicity, right? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. But um, I think, um, these, because of the quality of lives are, are so different, I think that universities should consider um, in terms of admissions, uh, in terms of uh, hiring a new faculty, they should really consider uh, not merely race, but also specific ethnic differences because of those differences in quality of lives and, uh, and opportunities. Um, and I, 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 my journey into this project that really began in like uh, around, probably around summer uh, 2019, uh, specifically because of the article from the New York Times uh, or a series of articles uh, in the New York Times released by Nicole Hannah Jones, the 1619 Project, which has gained a lot of um, traction over the past year because of all the uh, anti CRT. Um, anti-CRT laws being passed by uh, several state legislatures. Um, and Nicole Hannah's, uh, Jones's project of the 1619 project was said to be a part of the CRT movement. But um, anyway, so that project, uh, the, the 69 project, 1619 project in 2019, the, four, the 400th um, anniversary, Kind of had me thinking about specifically the Black American experience, right? And also that same year, you have uh, two individuals uh, who gained a lot of traction for what they call the ADOS movement, right? And uh, I, I, I'd, li I'd like to give them credit. Uh, and ADOS means American descendants of slavery. It's referring to Black Americans who. Um, have been here for several generations. They are not, they're not to be conflated with the more uh, recent uh, arrival of uh, black immigrants for, from say the um, uh, West Africa or the Caribbean. Um, and even uh, to some extent to be distinguished from many of the Caribbean, uh, black Caribbean immigrants who came here post, post bellum, right? Post civil war, right? So. I know many of them came to the United States in uh, the early, late 19th, early 20th century. So even to be distinguished from them, right? Um, and so to start this off, I want to show a video of uh, one of the founders of this political movement. Uh, her name is Yvette Cornell, 
And she's basically uh, explaining what she believes to be the justice claim of, of people of American descendants of, slave, of slavery. Um, and uh, I believe the screen is being shared, correct? You you should be able to um, let no. me know if you can't. Okay. <laughs> One second, you all. All right. Can you all see the uh, YouTube screen? Yes. Thank okay. You. So this is uh, ADO, ADOS explained by uh, the founder of the movement, uh, Yvette Carnell, explained in 60 seconds. So I'll give you a quick uh, a sound bite. And the, to set this up, she's explaining about, I don't know if you guys recall this, but she's uh, talking about um, the issue in 2019, 2020, when uh, Kamala Harris was uh, seeking the Democratic nomination for, for president. And there was a supposedly issue with people about her quote unquote blackness, right? And what the ADOS movement was saying is not an issue of her being black, it's that she's not um, an ADOS, right? She's not a, of this specific ethnic group, right? Um, so um, I'm gonna start the video and I'll proceed with the presentation. Uh, here we go. Ain't nobody been around here judging her blackness. What we have judged is her lineage and her attachment to American Dion's sentence of slaves. She has a Jamaican parent and an Indian parent, and neither of those parents is an is a American DOS, the sin of chattel slavery in this country. Not everywhere slavery. We know that was slavery in other parts of the world. But if you're in the Caribbean or one of those places, if you're in Haiti, then your, your, your issue, as we've said here many a time, is with the French. And if you ever get reparations from the French, I will clap. I will be happy. I will throw you a party. I will buy you a drink, baby. But I will not try to take your money. I will not try to eat that fruit because I don't have no bones buried in Haiti. My bones is buried in here. I celebrate you. I will help you. But I understand that that is yours. And I think you understand that, too. So the real issue is, just like I'm not Jamaican, just like I'm not Haitian, just like I'm not Eritrean, you are not American DOS. All right. So I want to stop it there. and. So yeah, um, and all right, can you all see the PowerPoint? Okay, okay, so, um, and you guys were just uh, uh, introduced to uh, the term American descendants of slavery. And it's just, uh, um, I would say at this point, it's, it's a political distinction. It was also a particular ethnic distinction, right? You're talking about um, uh, those people who are the descendants of people who were brought to, you know, what would become United States as, as slaves. And in that process, like they've, um, with the, the vestige of, vestiges of culture from West Africa and like combined with like the British colonial experience in the United States, like they formed something new, a new culture, right? Uh, a, a black American culture. And, I, and, and that's the distinction I'm trying to make, right? In, in this, that distinction needs to be made, right? Um, um, some, of the, some of the concepts that, um, since this is an ethical argument, some of the concepts that um, I'd like to introduce are, um, you know, hermeneutical, hermeneutical injustice, reparative justice, the ontology, and consequentialism. Right. So I know the uh, the latter three, the uh, reparative justice, the ontology, and consequentialism, are are I imagine terms that all of you are familiar with, um, given that these are are, are terms uh, used in normative ethics. Right. Um, the, the, the term that I want to put specific emphasis on is the uh, hermeneutical injustice. Um, and this term, uh, this term refers to like the mi misunderstanding of one's experience or uh, uh, another's experience or another group's experience, because like anything that um, there's just no inside knowledge of it, 
right? Because they've been excluded from uh, certain fields of knowledge and aren't able to really contribute to it, right? And the reason I introduced this term, because I think there's something uh, about the American experience that um, kind of refuses to give or afford um, ADOS people this like specific ethnic identity, right? It's um, Black American identity, ADOS, this is always specifically referred to in racial terms, right? Um, so I just wanted to, 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 to introduce that, right? That these people are, um, society's knowledge of them is so poor and, 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 um, well, there's a paucity of knowledge because, um, there really hasn't been any intent to, um, know them on that intimate level, right? On, on a, on a more intimate level, right? And then, and then they're also, they aren't contributing to the field. So, um, and I'll get more into the other three. Um, so one major question and one major pushback uh, that one gets when, when talking about this uh, matter is um, uh, why make these distinctions, right? Why make these distinctions, right? Um, so, the main reason for making this distinction um, that I talked about earlier is because of the, just the quality of life. Uh, these groups have very different quality of lives. Um, so I said black immigrants, immigrant groups tend to live in two-parent homes, uh, which is a strong indicator of future success uh, uh, or, or you know, participation in crime, et cetera. Um, parents and black immigrant uh, homes um, are more likely to have, um, you know, more likely to have post-secondary degrees, right? Um, a unit, at least a, a university education. Um, um, yeah, and black immigrant groups in their uh, progeny um, tend to earn more in income um, due to having these, these higher degrees, these secondary degrees, right? Um, and some of these differences are really cultural too. They're, they aren't just about um, uh, indicators of quality of life. Um, and one of these differences is cultural, right? So one, one cultural difference is, is that we'll see is that black immigrant groups uh, tend to express uh, less of an oppositional culture compared to ADOS. Um, and, you know, scholars attribute this largely due to the fact that, you know, these immigrant groups, you know, um, about, it's about agency, right? They willingly came to the United States, um, you know, largely to do to, for, to largely for a better economic opportunity or um, better education. So, um, so they, they're, 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 there tends to be less of an oppositional culture toward United States. They feel like the United States tends to um, have something to offer them, um, um, as opposed to, um, I'll, I'll just put it this way. I think when we think of, um, if we were to make a comparison between uh, Black immigrant groups and ADOS people, I think when we think of, uh, say, the issues in Ferguson or back in 2014, I think people tend to associate that more with the ADOS experience uh, as opposed to the black immigrant experience, right? Um, and because that's so synonymous with the black American experience, that's that kind of kind of oppositional culture toward um, America because of its history, right? Um, so um, in the in the process of of, of doing this research. Um, I found some studies that, you know, kind of um, indicate uh, institutional biases within uh, universities. And this biases, these biases are interesting because um, in one sense, it's suggesting that distinctions are being made, right? Um, but in a larger sense, um, it really seems like like at least in any formalized way, distinctions obviously aren't being made, but maybe um, 
these studies seem to suggest that perhaps that may be on a on a more um, subliminal or um, you know uh, subtle level that some kind of bias is taking place when colleges are uh, comparing um, ADOS black students to uh, black immigrant students. Um, and so McCleary Gaddy and Miller 2018 and McCleary Gaddy 2016 both noted that um, there seemed to be institution bias, institutional bias against ADOS and admissions um, when matched up against uh, black immigrants um, uh, or their children, right? Second generation. Um, uh, the earlier study, the one from 2016, um, pointed out that ADOS were like less likely to be admitted uh, and, uh, into university when the competitor was an African immigrant. But also revealed that African immigrants were evaluated as more likable. And, and, and I think this is the point I want to emphasize, um, that African immigrants were evaluated as more likable and competent compared to ADOS and more likely to be admitted, right? So I think the, the emphasis on likable and competent Right. Um, uh, I think it kind of speaks to uh, stereotypes. Right. Uh, I think it speaks to. Um, one can only surmise, though. Right. It, it generally speaks to to to. Uh, uh, thoughts about. Uh, thoughts on ADOS stereotypes. Um, and Gaddy, like Gaddy, uh, pretty much concluded that African immigrant students were preferred to ADOS, um, but the fact that they would still admit a black student kind of, kind of gave them cover against like discrimination, right? Because we're still admitting black students, but this is the particular black student that we want, right? Um, let's see. And, um, so, for, so the ethics I'm bringing into this um, um, that I introduced earlier, uh, virtue ethics, the ontology and consequentialism. Um, virtue ethics, uh, because I'm, I'm, bring, I'm bringing virtue ethics into this conversation mainly because, I mean, when you talk about ADOS, you're, you're largely talking about it. And, and um, when you're talking about ADOS and you're talking about uh, trying to strive for more representation in the in university system, um, for that specific group, I think you're talking about an issue of justice, right? So you can, I think you kind of have to include virtue ethics in that. Uh, deontology, I found it interesting because uh, I included this because uh, it's basically uh, saying, um, it's basically, I think deontology holds universities accountable and the society at whole ac accountable, right? Um, Basically, I'm asking, you know, deontology would ask, you know, you want to act in such a way that it become that it becomes, the, you know, that you can will it into, into becoming a universal law, right? That you could wish this upon others that it become a universal law. And with deontology, um, I'm, and it kind of feeds into the, the justice aspect of, of the virtue ethics, um, is that... You know, I, I imagine most rational human beings would not will themselves to, to be someone's slave, right? So um, I think deontology, uh, adding that aspect is a way of, of just holding universities accountable, right, for um, past injustice toward this particular group, um, and specifically the institution of slavery, right? Um, and consequentialism, right? Um, I actually want to consider the like the consequences to a particular group um, if representation um, if representation in uh, non HBCU institutions and, and in this case particularly uh, um, I'm concerned with elite uh, universities when it comes to the perspective of consequentialism because um, you know, the Ivy Leagues have, um, they produce an inordinate amount of very influential people. And, um, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, um, uh, if trends continue, um, 
like what are the consequences for ADOS as a group in terms of uh, institutional influence, institutional power, things of that nature, right? Um, so I, I put, so to start off from the perspective, start off with like restorative justice, the, the virtue ethics uh, aspect of this. Um, actually, um, uh, I begin with slavery, right? And I took this quote from the uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates article. I think everybody may recognize this article. The one from 2014, the case of reparations for reparations, right? In 2014, the, um, the, the large essay. Um, but um, so I took a quote from that. And this basically, uh, the, the by 1860 quote, right? This basically sums up um, the the monetary worth of at the time um, of of human chattel, right? Um, and it just shows how um, dependent the American economy was on it, right? Because it was a, such a huge share of the American economy, right? So I'll read it. It says by 1860 there were more millionaires, uh, slaveholders, all living in the Lower Mississippi Valley than anywhere else in the United States. And that same year, the nearly 4 million American slaves were worth some $3.5 making them the largest single financial asset in the entire U.S. economy, worth more than all the manufacturing and railroads combined. Um, and so um, I think just based on that alone, right, they're worth. And uh, this is a matter of justice. Um, I'm saying that, you know, Many of these, many of these um, early universities, the Ivy Leagues, right, who were around before uh, uh, the country was even created, um, these universities uh, participate in slavery. Uh, a lot of the Ivy Leagues, to some extent, um, and I'm just saying, it just seems that in knowing that. Um, universities and knowing that universities uh many universities took place um and extracting wealth from people right using people right um you know if, if they were you know if they were you know serious about atonement then one would imagine that um you know they'd make some uh, good faith effort to um restore some kind of, uh, you know, justice to that particular community, right? Um, if, if, if something was extracted from it, right? Um, and, okay, uh, deontology, right? Um, so the case of deont deontology, um, you know, um, we have the, uh, the 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 maxims from uh, Immanuel Kant. Uh, uh, basically, like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, sorry about the spelling. Uh, you know, and act in such a way that um, um, you know you're not treating people you know as merely a means, right? But ends in themselves, right? Um, and obviously, slaves are our means, right? And um, for deontology, I give this very specific uh, example um, of Georgetown. And I don't, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with uh, Georgetown, like probably since 2019, maybe a year or two before that, but, you know, uh, uh, their student body has like, has basically uh, at one point voted on to like, give reparations to um i believe the descendants of um of the descendants of the 272 slaves um that were um that saved georgetown in 1838 georgetown was a 
in danger of lose of, of their doors closing. And there was um, there was a, a sale and slaves were sold and it allowed the university to keep their door open, uh, their doors open in 1838. Um, basically, uh, you know, from the deontological perspective is, uh, you know, you know, no one would, you know, would willingly become a slave. Um, you know, one shouldn't use another individual as a means to an end. In this case, slaves are being used as a means to upkeep the university, keeping running order. And there were means to to keep the university open, right? Um, and tying that back into the the, the, the justice uh, aspect of this, I mean, then you know, if if one is serious about justice, um, then um, you know, one would try to uh, atone by try to you know um, repair the damage as much as much as, as much as possible, right? And 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 as to what that could be, um, I'm not going to speculate, but um, you know, obviously there should be an effort. Um, and, and consequentialism. Um, and basically I'm, I'm concerned, like what, what, what are the consequences of ADUS being very extremely underrepresented and particularly elite universities, right? Um, and I work, I mean, you know, and I think about, you know, essentially like very famous black Americans who have gone to uh, one in particular, um, who has gone to an elite university, but um, it's not necessarily ADOS. I'm thinking of you know Barack Obama, right? Who's not necessarily ADOS, but um, he went to um, Harvard and Columbia, Harvard for law school, and even Barack Obama is a, a kind of a great. Um, like a writ large example of, of, what, of what I'm demonstrating, the differences in uh, attendance uh, in elite university among um, ADOS and um, black immigrant groups and their, and their descendants, right? He's a, he's a great writ large representation of that, right? Um, and he ascended to become you know, the president of the United States, right? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned is like, my concern is if we're, con if we, we, if ADOS people are, you know, uh, not targeted specifically, targeted in 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 in, in such a way, um, and trends continue, um, then then what are what are the consequences for ADOS as a group when they're not, um, they're not in the room where decisions are made, so to speak, right? Um, um, Sorry, I'll have to move this around. Um, so, um, one re recommendation, I think, um, one recommendation that I came across, and I'm going to introduce some some suggested readings, and um, so yes, yeah, some suggested readings. Um, one thing that I come across is. Um, as you can probably tell, this is like, this issue is larger than a university issue. I think this is an issue of, um, this is probably really more of a, a sociological issue, right? That I'm applying to specifically to the, the realm of education, right? Um, but one suggestion, um, that I would recommend uh, universities do is to, um, when students are filling out, you know, applications for 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 entrance, um, that they actually ask, um, particularly if you mark the category black, like to be more specific about your origins, right? Like, you know, what are your countries of origin? What is what is your country of origin, right? Um. um and, and I, I think that that could help better uh, make the distinction that needs to be made uh, um, to to single out ADOS people, right? Um, and I believe the U.S. Census uh, um, not too long ago kind of made this distinction themselves, right? When you fill out the category black, they actually ask you your country of origin, 
um, to make uh, distinctions. But I think they should go a step further to, to, to just ask for country of origin. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's enough because then you get into an issue of, of um, get into an issue of uh, a generational issue, right? You know, somebody may be second, third, fourth generation, and they may actually, you know, really identify with the ADOS experience, right? Being in America for so long, right? So that that's that that's something I'm I'm really toggling with, like, um, basically lineage, like how far back does it go, right? Like how what is what is the uh, line of demarcation, right? Um, but anyway. Um, see for further readings um i really hope you get can you all see this this text on the screen okay um so two two readings that have been very very uh influential in um this process is um because of our success the changing racial and ethnic ancestry of blacks on affirmative action by uh kevin brown he's who's actually a lawyer i believe he's out of the University of Indiana, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this book, it does a great job in making those distinctions between uh, ADOS. He doesn't call them ADOS. He actually calls them, he uses the term, uh, I believe he uses the term ascendant blacks uh, to refer to ADOS people, uh, to make the distinction between them and uh, uh, black immigrant groups. And, um, yeah, I have to credit him for that uh, recommendation for the uh, country of origin when one marks the uh, black racial category on, on a document. Um, and the second, um, the second uh, influential reading was uh, beyond the Asian American category, disaggregating data by ethnic group for better assessment. Um, this is very interesting the year that this came out because this is exactly what I'm trying to do. Her, this paper is exactly what I'm trying to do. And it came out around the same time period um, that I initially started working on um, making black ethnic distinctions, right? For better assessment to better cater to the needs of a particular group, right? So um, these two uh, texts have been very influential. And um, yeah. Um, that is all, that is all, um, thanks, thank you. Thank you, thank you, James Murray, fantastic. Um, I'm gonna open up the floor for questions uh, in, the, in the chat first before I start taking over and running my mouth. <laughs> uh, any questions from our participants? Or maybe while they maybe while they they type, if, if that's what's happening, I'll just go ahead and and ramble. Um, this was so enlightening. I had no idea about um, what happened at Georgetown, and 1838 is a is a lot closer than we might think when when looking at the. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, right? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it takes a while for prejudice to be purged from the collective psyche. And uh, my goodness, that's that was revealing. Um, I guess I have a, a question comment. I, I'm not so sure what it is. Uh, but thinking about the consequences of uh, disaggregating this, this data and, and putting uh, more specific categories out there, uh, such as ADOS, um, do you think that will help uh, universities build up uh, support groups as well? Not just, um, oops, oh, <laughs> oh what? Oh, or You're not? Oh, did I? Oh gosh, okay. Um, would that, would this uh, information, this more specific information, help universities build other supports? You know, not, not just letting them in, but uh, being more accommodating for the cultural differences that are going to exist between folks who have been excluded and then the, those these elite university types who have their own lineage at the seat of the table. Um, 
you speak to Zep. Um, I apologize. I missed a, a, a lot of the questions. I think you were frozen on my end, right? So I, I missed a lot of the question. I, I apologize. Oh, but, no, that's okay. Um, um, do you think that this more specific data can help universities build student student outreach and support programs. Um, I mean, it's been in my experience, and, and I'm, a, I'm a white person. You know, I come from hillbilly folk, and I didn't understand the uh, culture of academic philosophy, which is so highfalutin and proper. And I unknowingly, you know, made some trouble for myself. And then when I found out I made trouble. I just intentionally made more. So that's kind of on me. But it, it took me a while to navigate the cultural differences between where I was coming from and these uh, the, an elitist an elitist setting. Um, so I just I I I want to see more support for everybody, whatever their whether you be um, um, whatever minority group you might be in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just want more support for everybody. So I, I feel like these distinctions could help the university, you know, build better support. And I didn't know what what you thought of that. Or um, most definitely, it definitely will help them better better cater to the needs of a specific group. Right. I think the, I think the issue right now is that um, I think the way that. You know, particularly, I think this is particularly the case with black, with, with using the term black in the American context, right? Is that in one sense, so there, there's an issue with the language, right? So in one sense, when we use the term black, uh, black in the uh, uh, context of the United States, I think j people generally assume that you're talking about an ADOS person, right? That you're talking about a person with lineage in the United States, right? going back several hundred years, but at the same time, like, and, and, and by the way, the like ADOS make up about 90% of the black American population. But because black is often associated with ADOS, um, it, it essentially seems like everyone is, almost everyone is assumed in that category, the racial category is assumed to be ADOS upon, you know, if one doesn't reflect on things, right, upon initial glance, right? Um, but the thing about that, though, is, you know, because everybody is assumed to be an ADOS, um, when, say, for example, when Barack Obama became president, right, people probably, I mean, he's obviously a biracial man, but they probably assume that He's a biracial man with an ADOS father, and he, he's not. He's his father's from Kenya. And um, so his success gets conflated onto the ADOS success because people don't know the distinctions. And like his success, right, uh, gets pushed onto the ADOS community. And it, it ends up attributing success to success that we don't have right um and I, I think that's i think that's the thing that really uh really frustrates me is that people are placed in this ados category um just because they're black and they may have extremely different uh cultural um upbringings uh very different like quality of life because they're not part of the ADOS culture, right? Um, and they, all that stuff gets conflated and um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a mess. It's a mess. And I think I really, for some reason, why I really introduced the term hermeneutical justice again is because I really think like America really has a problem understanding ADOS, Black these, these people that were here for several generations as a distinct ethnic group, right? Like we're always, again, we're always looked at in racial terms, right? Um, and ethnicity implies culture, right? So um, I don't know if I answered your question, um, but um, I, I do think 
that that'll definitely help. That'll definitely help making that. Distinction. Yeah, just thinking about uh, to, to put it in in your presentation's terms, thinking about the quality of life and and maybe uh, social status that you know uh, might mark the distinction and, and, between subgroups here. Right. Yeah. Um, and and you think that um, because it's you would think that there would be better support for ADOS folks uh, if this assumption is rampant. But what I think is, is fascinating is that when you look at the studies you first presented, you know, there was such a yeah against right. Um, I think. Um, I think some of some of some of the stuff going on in these studies. I really think um, I think there are certain cult, there are certain phenomena that that phenomena that go on within certain cultural groups that outgroup members may not be really aware of. And one of these is the kind of um, there's a kind of there seems to be a kind of in, in a sense a larger uh, larger cultural bias against. Uh, ADOS compared to black immigrant and black uh, West African um, uh, immigrant groups. And, and then this stereotype, um, so there, there's a stereotype of, you know, ADOS folks, the, the history of ADOS folks, and the history of ADOS folks. There's the, the, the stereotype of, you know, us, uh, us being, you know, shiftless, lazy, whatever that stereotype, right? Whereas many black immigrants are seen to be the exact opposite of that, right? Industrious, studious. Um, and that kind of fits into the, the larger um, immigrant stereotype story too, right? It's not just exclusive to uh, black immigrant groups, right? So um, I don't, th this is a lot to, to, to think about. Um, I'm still wrestling with it because I think there are larger like sociological like implications behind it. And I really wanted to apply it to uh, the realm of education, specifically higher education. So. Yeah, I mean, just that, they, that, that these immigrant folks were considered more likable. Right. The it, that, I think that points to that underlying um, subconscious prejudice that's playing out. Um, and it just might be that these immigrant folks are more accustomed to that status that uh, an elite university or that, that cultural status, that cushion that's there, um, that atmosphere that's about, that they just match it better, mirror it more closely. Um, and then you have someone who comes from outside of that setting and who ought to be in there. As you've said, uh, you know, uh, there needs to be representation at the table. Everyone should have a, a seat at the table. Uh, and it's it's not only to the benefit of everybody who's represented, but the institute that it's holding the table. It is. It would be so helpful for these elite realms to open up to diverse thought, um, for healthy, healthy debate. Uh, you know, intellectual rigor uh, to have a full perspective on the world we we claim to represent in philosophy and, and the humanities and such. You know. So. Um, also, uh, I wanted to add from the perspective of the con consequentialism. Also, you know. Um, you know, I was uh, fixated on elite universities. Um, also, uh, with the, um, I guess, relatively, you know, ADOS being underrepresented in these institutions, um, you know, their voices aren't aren't reflected in those universities, right? So when people want to hear, I think, like when, when, when black perspectives are, 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 are represented at those universities um it, such as university like harbor like the 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 ados black experience is a minority experience among the black students right um many of them are um caribbean immigrants or uh the second or third generation of caribbean or west african immigrants right so that's wild to hear, and and you know, thank you for for pointing that out. Um, that uh, yet another wild statistic in America. 
Uh, but it's, it's work that we need to do, uh, uh, writing this wrong, I think, for the benefit of, of, of ADOS and again for the humanities and, and the institutions that have the money to fund it. <laughs> That's some, that's a concern that I have is, you know, especially for philosophy, you see uh, uh, departments getting cut from uh, f- from existence left and right, right. At universities or at least having their budgets so deflated that they can no longer support a major or a minor in philosophy that might be an intro class and that's it. And, you know, I've, I've thought you know, as, worris- as, as worrisome as it is, I do think that philosophy will always have its home where it's always founded in, in the upper elite echelon uh, of, of <laughs> like, there will always be a philosophy department at Harvard and Yale because they can afford so, something so, so seemingly unproductive. Um, <laughs> it's something so, uh, I mean, uh, uh, so, you know, those universities, if they are going to safe house top research and philosophy and be the only places where you can find it outside of struggling little little institutions like ours, um, I think they have a duty to ensure that they have voices from all the groups they claim to represent in their theories and their practices. Uh, if, if philosophy is going to be held captive by the people who have the money to do so, um, you know, my goodness, at, at least branch away from the west of, from the rest of the Western canon, and at least be in conversation with with many voices and and assumptions about the world, how the way the world works. I can't even talk right. Now. You got me all fired up. <laughs> you know, I, that's just you know a major complaint of of mine and a major motivation for this nonprofit is that my goodness. Who are these? Who are these dead white men uh, telling the whole world how the world works and having such a limited perspective on it, creating law and institution from those assumptions about the world, and then keeping the world out, though it claims to represent it, and it's and from which it's taking funds. <laughs> I, oh my goodness! Ah, sorry. I love this work that you're doing. <laughs> Uh, did anyone have any any other questions or anything? Word. I'll I'll stop recording then. Okay. Uh, thank you all for, for for joining us for another installment of the Scholar Spotlight series. Thank you again, James Murray. That was fantastic. Yeah.